All right, so for our end of the presentation, General Air Products is a manufacturer of air compressors, dry air generators, nitrogen generators, fire protection accessories, and uh, 13D pump and tank systems. Uh, today, we'll, we'll focus our presentation on the fire protection uh, air supply accessories, uh, especially the um, air maintenance device, pressure switch, and uh, uh, magnetic line starters. Uh, so again, if you have questions, please hit me up with them. Um, and that's also, you know, if you have questions down the road or, or whatever, please, you know, keep my email address around. Um, General Air Products, we, we pride ourselves on, on being very responsive to the fire sprinkler industry, uh, being a part of it and, and being responsive to it and, and understanding the needs and meeting the needs. And, and then that means, you know, that's why we do these webinars and it's why we, we try to educate as much as possible. So one, I would say, you know, again, you have some kind of broad questions, things like that, send them to me uh, at rmfjr at generalairproducts.com. Um, if you have more immediate need questions, like you're looking at one of our pieces of equipment in the field or your people are, there is no reason to wonder uh, or kick it around back and forth or whatever. Just call our 800 number and our techs here will help you. We're happy to do that uh, always. Uh, presenters in the fire sprinkler industry have been asked to put up a disclaimer like this, so we do. Uh, any opinion expressed is the personal opinion of the author and presenter and does not necessarily represent the official position of the NFPA and its technical committees. So again, um, you know, these are our read on these things, um, you know, with any of these presenters. And and uh, if you need something more official, like an official uh, opinion, you need to go to the NFPA or the technical committees for it. Um, but this, uh, you know, we do this based off of our own expertise and we've been dealing with this equipment for a long, long time. So today what we're gonna cover, what is an air maintenance device? Uh, I'll, you know, kind of differentiate the two main types of air maintenance devices. We'll talk about when an air maintenance device is required. We'll get into magnetic line starters or motor starters, um, pressure switches, and then uh, we have a handful of other accessories that go along with our products that I, you know, like to bring up and talk about uh, just to make people aware of them and how they function. So, without further ado, we will get started with what is an air maintenance device. An air maintenance device is an assembly of valves, nipples, fittings, and actuators designed specifically for use in dry and pre-action fire sprinkler systems to automatically regulate the pressure and flow of compressed air or gas uh, from the air supply to the piping system, or to the system piping. So that's, uh, I don't know, usually I don't just go reading slides, but there's no better way to say that, so we just do it. Um, but that's what an air maintenance device is. and. <clears throat> You know, this slide shows you, you know, again, going old school here, there used to be just uh, put an air compressor on it. Now it's what type of air compressor. As you can see here, there's lots of types of air compressors. And there are uh, situations in which you would apply an air maintenance device to any of these types of compressors. Um, not all the time, you know, especially with riser mount compressors, but uh, often. Um, and how many and uh, and which ones and when to apply them is stuff that we're going to get into as we go forward here. So first thing that makes uh, this uh, series of uh, uh, pipes, nipples, valves, et cetera, uh, an air maintenance device is its UL or FM, uh, UL listing or FM approval. So to be a, uh, an air maintenance device, it must be listed, uh, listed or approved. Um, that said, you know, you'll see there, there's a lot of companies that make an air maintenance device. There's probably close to eight or 10 on the market at this point. And um, with those um, comes a variety of designs, but they're essentially working the same. Um, and you can break those designs down into two main types, and that's with or without a pressure switch. As you can see, the the air maintenance device on the right is an air maintenance device with a pressure switch. And we're going to talk about what the differences there are more specifically. So we call these our AMD1 and AMD2. The AMD1 is the uh, air maintenance device without a pressure switch, and the AMD2 is an air maintenance device with a pressure switch. 
and AMD won, and I, I'll go back and forth using the term AMD. We just, that's our shorthand for it around here, and that's what we, so that's what I might be referring to it, AMD is air maintenance device. So the AMD one is used when compressed air is supplied through existing factory air supply, when there's a tank mounted unit, or when you have a flow of uh, greater than 5.5 CFM coming from your air compressor. An air maintenance device or AMD2 is used when the air supply device, like the compressor that you have, does not have a pressure switch of its own. So this would be the pressure switch in that instance. So at General Air Products, we use our AMD2 in conjunction with our L series or L plus series uh, base mounted lubricated air compressor. The base mounted lubricated air compressors are, are, you know, an old school style of air compressor that you don't have a pressure switch on typically. So, you know, a pressure switch on a compressor is the brains of the compressor. It tells the compressor to turn off and on when certain pressures are reached. Uh, you know, 40 PSI, it, you know, it senses that it's at 40 PSI, it sends a signal to the motor to shut off, it senses that it's at 30 PSI, it sends a signal to the motor to turn on. Some, you know, or some, you know, the, the pressures can be different, but that's essentially how it functions. It's an on or off uh, sort of uh, mechanism. And uh, any compressor needs that, or when you bring it power, it's just going to run. Uh, and that's what it is with the L-series unit. But I also like to bring up that um, gassed compressors, there's oftentimes people purchase those with no controls. Uh, they have a version of their riser mount oilless compressors that have no controls. And you need an AMD2 or air maintenance device with a pressure switch uh, when one of those is in. The reason very specifically that I bring that one up is that if you ever replace, like let's say you have a setup, you have a, a, a dry valve, it's got a, um, uh, a, a riser mount, no controls compressor with an air maintenance device or AMD2. And after, you know, whatever amount of time, that air compressor goes bad and has to be replaced. Uh, you replace it with a new compressor, a new riser mount compressor, let's say a general air products riser mount air compressor that comes with a pressure switch. Now you have two pressure switches, essentially. So you have to make sure that only the pressure switch that's on the compressor in that situation is the one that's wired up. The one on the air maintenance device, frankly, that air maintenance device should probably be removed and replaced with just a small piece of pipe. Um, but, you know, I, the reason I bring this up is every once in a while, more often than I'd like to admit uh, to the industry, but we get a call from people uh, who have both pressure switches wired up. Um, and that causes chaos for the air compressor. You're, you're reading different pressure at different times uh, in a very short period, like a short, a small amount of volume, let's say. So as those pressure fluctuations occur, the pressure switches are telling it to turn on, turn off. You're gonna get a lot of crazy cycling and things like that. So, you know, again, there should only ever be one pressure switch hooked up to the compressor. And if it's in an instance where you, you know, have one of these old AMD twos, Kind of sitting around there uh hooked up to you know a a compressor that doesn't have that uh that's fine until you replace it with a compressor that does have a pressure switch um so hopefully that makes sense there to you um and, and might save you some headache down the road this is a, a parts breakdown of the uh, amd2 um again the the key part here is number nine the pressure switch um We'll talk about some of these other parts. Eight, the sensing line. I guess those would be the two main differences between the AMD2 and the AMD1. So going back to uh, now the AMD1 or, uh, air, yeah, air maintenance device AMD1 without the pressure switcher, it has a, a, a pressure regulator. This style of device is, is um, with the regulator, not the pressure switch, is, is, is by far the most common. Um, that's because there's very limited, there's very small amounts of compressors that are sold in the fire sprinkler market anymore that do not have a pressure switch already included with them. Um, so really the, the AMD one is the one you should be dealing with all the time. Again, I bring that up because sometimes people just feel like they need to order the AMD2 because it's like an upgrade or something like that. It's not an upgrade uh, to a more fancy AMD or anything. It's about having the right parts on there that you need. 
um, and any compressor that has a pressure switch doesn't need an AMD2. It only needs the AMD1 with the air regulator. So an AMD1 or an air maintenance device is used when compressed air is supplied through an existing factory or shop air supply. So if you have an existing air supply uh, in a facility uh, and you're running a line from that to the sprinkler system, you're gonna put an AMD1 in line there or an air maintenance device in line there to regulate that pressure. That really was the invention of the air maintenance device was going way back uh, in the standard, you know, as dry systems were becoming, I guess, starting, they were starting in a lot of manufacturing facilities that already had large compressed air supplies. Um, and a lot of the ways to keep some costs down there at that time was to run a line from the existing air supply to the fire sprinkler system. But these large air compressors, um, you know, 100 horsepower, 200 horsepower air compressor that supplies, you know, compressed air for a variety of uses throughout a manufacturing facility. If you have that kind of uh, horsepower, which is going to generally equate with very, very significant flow, uh, is going to send that flow to the fire sprinkler system when, when a head goes off. And it's just going to keep running and it's going to run a lot. Um, and it can potentially prevent the valve from opening. So that's where the air, uh, the dry valve from opening. So that's where the air maintenance device comes in is so that you limit that flow. So you don't have the full capability of a compressor uh, trying to uh, keep up with a, uh, the air loss associated with the head going off. So compressed air is supplied through an existing factory or shop air supply when using any tank mounted uh, fire protection air compressor. So any tank mounted compressor is going to require an air maintenance device. And then when using any compressor above 5.5 CFM. And you know we'll go over this information multiple times in multiple ways throughout because it's often confusing the way that it's put in the standard, just the wording is a little tricky. Um, but really the way the wording reads is if you're above 5.5 CFM, required for filling your sprinkler system in 30 minutes, you should be in a tank mounted unit anyway, in which case you need an AMD1. Um, but that said, you can have a uh, smaller um, fire protection air compressor uh, that puts out less than 5.5 CFM. And uh, at that point, if it's a tank mounted unit, you still need the uh, AMD1 air maintenance device with the air regulator. There we are. So here's a parts breakdown there. Uh, inlet and outlet one and four. Um, that's the fill line. Um, two two represents the fill valve. Three is the fill line. Um, inlet and outlet one and four. Um, that's important to understand. You know, again, questions we get uh, from time to time are that uh, the air maintenance device uh, or, or the compressor isn't meeting the 30 minute fill up time, what's wrong with the compressor? And then we come to find out that the compressor is being used while to fill the system in 30 minutes with the fill line closed. Uh, the fill line must be open in the orientation that, that you're shown here. And then once you get up to your, your 30 minute fill and you get your 40 PSI in, in 30 minutes, um, you then close that fill line and open the regulator line or the, you know, yeah, the, uh, so that the air goes from the compressor through the uh, Y strainer and into the uh, air regulator and then out into the system. Another thing I want to call out here is the Y strainer itself. Um, the Y strainer, it, you see this part here, hopefully you can see my cursor, but you see this part here that goes down. This is a trap for debris. So we get questions a lot of time about, can we orient the uh, AMD1 instead of the orientation that we're looking at here, but upside down. The only problem with that is that the Y strainer is then where it's supposed to catch debris from and prevent debris from getting into the regulator is now facing up and no debris is going to be caught up in there. Uh, so what we recommend you do is that if you do flip the orientation on installation for, for this unit, is to then turn the uh, Y strainer so that this trap, the debris trap is facing down and can catch that uh, debris before it gets to the regulator. The regulator is, is, is again, it's, it's a restricted orifice. So 
you don't want to get anything in there or else you're not going to have any airflow or you're going to have limited airflow. Another thing I want to bring up, and I was just in some meetings about this and, and I, I wanted to make people aware, uh, we have a new, and I'll show you what's new about it, but we have a new uh, air regulator uh, for our air maintenance device. It looks a little different than what uh, the one is here. Um, it's a really heavy duty plastic, which at first, like I, I've said in past ones, I wasn't really thrilled with the idea of going to plastic until I saw it. And I saw that this was really uh, strong plastic because we've seen some other ones on the market that used, to plastic, used plastic regulators and they seem to be prone to breaking and both breaking and slipping as far as uh, their um, uh, where you're holding the control at. Um, and uh, so we switched to this one, uh, which which works out well, uh, like I said, overall, but the uh, that number eight, that port where you can put in a uh, pressure gauge um, that we include in the box with ours, uh, the manufacturer changed on us the uh, that little fitting, that little plug that goes in there to a brass piece and we've had some reports of people getting um, stripping that plug, trying to get it out. Um, I, and I want you to know, one, call us if that comes up and we'll see what we can do to help you out. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, against, I, I don't know, whatever, whatever comes up, we can, we will work with you. But just if you see that happening um, with one of them, you know, just uh, give us a call and we'll see what we can do for you. But that said, um, I wanted to also let anybody know who has seen that issue that we're switching from a brass plug to back to a steel plug. We're doing that general air, you know, the, the manufacturer won't do it, but we decided we're going to do it. When it comes in here, we're going to take the brass plugs out and put in our own steel plugs uh, of the same size so that they can, um, so we don't have this problem in the field. So if you look at this one on the left here, this is our original design. Uh, and it is, um, you know, that's that's the vast majority of what's out in the field. We sold that design uh, since the 1980s. So there's, there's many of them out in the field. Um, we updated this design um, or, or the original design in, uh, gosh, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, I wanna say it was less than 10 years ago. Um, that we updated this this uh, to this version where what we did was we just taped over the set screw and then changed the orientation of the regulator to stick out about 10 degrees so you could easily get a, a, a screwdriver into the set screw. The um, and, and the reason I bring that up is because that you know that came those changes came directly from the field. Uh, we also added the pressure gauge too to the box so you can use the pressure gauge or not. But that said, you know, th those were things that we got feedback in the field. Hey, we really need to do this, you know, th or this is really a problem. So, you know, again, we're, we're very responsive to customer feedback and that and you can be shown in that. Um, then in 2020, like I said, we switched to this uh, heavy duty plastic regulator um, that's, like I said, it's really sturdy um, and makes adjustment a whole lot easier. Um, but just make sure that, you know, if you see this little cap here, you want to pull it down turn the adjustment and push it back up, uh, lock it back into place. So um, it's the, the instructions are in the box. It's very simple to use um, and you don't need a screwdriver or anything for it. So it, it really does, I think, uh, work a lot better now. Before I go any further here, Dave, do you have any questions on air maintenance devices? Ray, I think we're good. We've had a bunch come in. I'm answering them right now, but I, I think I'm good. Great. Okay, I'll keep going. All right. So, where uh, when is an air maintenance device required? Um, you know, again, part of the the thing that spawned this whole presentation was the idea that um, uh, you know a, a lot of people have a lot of questions about air maintenance devices and when to use them, where to use them, all that kind of stuff. And it kind of uh, jumped out at me when uh, when um, I was reading through a uh, Facebook group. Um, and, and the question had come up probably for the fifth or 10th time, something like that. And there was, you know, I'm reading through all of the answers and they were all close, but none of them were quite right. And, um, it really made me realize that, that you know, there, there's a need for 
uh, some clarity on this. So, you know, in this particular thread, I just thought it was funny. Um, you know, so when when the uh, the woman who asked the question, when is an air maintenance device required? Uh, there was a variety of answers. Um, like I said, better safe than sorry, put one in there, not required on riser mounted tankless compressors. We found one riser mounted air compressor on site today. At this time, it hasn't been determined what idiot put it there. Um, I wonder what the code book says. The only time they're required is when you have a have tank stored air or shop air, period. Um, so, you know, like I said, none of them are quite right. Some of them are funny. Um, but uh, you know, so let's let's clear it up here. So first, NFPA 13, uh, the 2019 edition, you know, you'll find most of the information pertaining to uh, air supplies in A266 uh, in the, the section titled Automatic Air Maintenance. A2661 is where you get that, says that unless the requirements of A2662 are met, an air maintenance device must be used to control air pressure and maximum airflow to the dry system. So what we're, what they're saying is that you know and again this is where it reads a little tricky is it's 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 something that you have to use all the time except is and the except is 82662 so use it all the time except when the air compressor supplying the dry pipe system has a capacity of less than 5.5 cubic feet per minute at 10 psi an air receiver or air maintenance device then shall not be required so this is you know so Basically, anything over 5.5 CFM, you need to put it an air maintenance device on. So one way we've made that easy for everybody is that we list our average CFM down here. Anything over 5.5, we put an asterisk, uh, or, or I'm sorry, yeah, you use this average CFM, and then anything over 5.5, the so you see our OL615, OL915, OL1225, these units all require an air maintenance device. But again, as you read through that section, something to keep in mind is that over 5.5 uh, CFM, they're telling you that you should have a tank mounted unit at that point as well. Um, so then that makes it an easy move to get that. So technically, uh, by the standard, most people should not, you know, depending on what, uh, what year of the standard that you're using, um, Technically, anything above 5.5 uh, CFM uh, compressor-wise needs to have an air maintenance device with it um, and should be tank mounted. So another question that comes up very common with air maintenance devices is what if I have one system tied, uh, more than one system tied to the air compressor? So if you have one compressor and three, four, five, six dry systems, again, I'll, I'll just put a word in here for that, that there is nothing in the standard that says that you can't tie one air compressor to 20 systems. Um, the standard doesn't include good sense. Um, it, it just tells you what, what you should and shouldn't do uh, based off of you know uh, feedback and everything. We're trying to get some changes made in this regard because that you really should not set 20 systems on one air compressor. You're really putting a lot of work onto that air compressor, but not only that, you're going to kill it uh, very early. Um, it's, you know, compressors don't really last by years, they last by hours, um, run hours. So like our air compressors last anywhere from 5,000 to 8,000 run hours. Um, the kind of compressor you'd pick up at Home Depot last, you know, about 500 run hours. Um, so ours lasts about 10 times that. Uh, but those the the point being is that you know the more systems that you hook up to a compressor, the more run hours that you're going to to have out of that compressor each year. Especially as the systems age, you know, and they they age a lot, you're going to have that compressor running a lot. Um, that being said, uh, there is nothing that limits the amount of systems that you can put to a compressor. Um, but we recommend no more than three or four systems per compressor is is our recommendation so that you can realize the full life of the equipment. Um, you know, again, we want to see 10 to 15 years out of all of our equipment. Um, 
and doing uh, and, and keeping it to no more than three or four systems is going to help you realize that. If you start putting five, 10, 15 systems on one air compressor, you can be relatively sure that it is only gonna last, you know, a couple years at best. That said, 82663 and 826631 clear up this this question of what would we do uh, in these situations in regards to an air maintenance device and that's anytime a compressor is serving multiple systems each system must have an air maintenance device one air maintenance device on the compressor serving multiple systems is not sufficient okay so uh, we do see a lot of people try to do that where they have one air compressor serving five, six, seven systems, even two systems, and they have one air maintenance device coming out of the air compressor. By the standard, that is not allowed, and you need to have one air maintenance device per dry valve or per, per riser. And just so you know, when I say dry valve, I mean pre-action valves as well. It's, I just use those terms interchangeably. Um, So let's put this another way. Uh, an air maintenance device is again required on any system with a tank mounted air compressor. So anytime you have a tank mounted air compressor, you will need an AMD one uh, with an air regulator. Uh, any system served by an air compressor with a flow above 5.5 CFM. So if your flow is above 5.5 CFM, you need an air maintenance device. If you're using a riser mounted air compressor in that instance, you need an air maintenance device. But a riser mounting compressor with an air maintenance device is not typically a good idea. Uh, you get a lot of short cycling because there's uh, a lot of volume and pressure gets built up just in the small amount of piping between the two. And as that pressure bleeds off, um, the compressor kind of runs for a short amount of times to catch up with the loss of pressure in the run between the compressor and the AMD. Uh, each system, when one tank mounted compressor is serving multiple systems, so again, you need an air maintenance device on each riser um, that a compressor is hooked up to, not just the one compressor. Couple tips here. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but you know, again, make sure you fill your system with your air maintenance device in fill mode. And you can see the uh, orientation there uh, for fill mode. Uh, and ensure any additional isolation valves are uh, on the system are open. Um, so you, you want you want the full flow of the air compressor when you're getting your 30 minute fill. And after that, we want to regulate it down. So you fill it up to 40 psi in 30 minutes as fast as possible. Watch that though if you're using a uh, shop air supply that has really high pressure or really high flow, you can do some damage to the system if you uh, if you let that go full flow. Um, but that would be outside of what a fire protection air compressor is and more into in line with really high-end industrial compressors, which you just don't see as much anymore. Um, also, and I should get a better picture here, but hopefully you can see on your screen there, but this this is the part that I was telling you about. This is the Y strainer here. And this is the part that catches the debris. Something else for any of you um, uh, uh, maintenance guys out there, uh, anybody who's doing uh, service work, this plug comes out so that you can clean out the air maintenance device. So what you do is you just close these valves, uh, let the pressure bleed out, um, and then uh, pop off this uh, part of the uh, Y strainer uh, and clean it out of any debris and then put it back. It's a good inspection uh, point to make. Another uh, tip here, when using an air maintenance device, um, the pressure from the compressor should be five to 10 PSI higher than what your system pressure is. So if you're holding the system at 40 PSI, kick your compressor up to at least 45 to 50 PSI and let the regulator do the work to hold it back. Um, it, it will work fine. Um, the other there's a big advantage there though from a compressor runtime uh if you were to uh put the regulator let's say again at 40 psi so that you have 40 psi in your system and you have a compressor that can go up to 60 psi turn it up to 60 psi um and let the regulator hold that back and what happens is you have a lot more stored volume of air 
So as the system leaks, it weeps into the um, it weeps into the system, but it doesn't necessarily from the reserves, and it doesn't necessarily cause the compressor to run uh, every time that the system needs some more volume. So what what it does is essentially make sure that your volume is a little bit um, uh, the volume of air on the compressor end is uh, holding more than than it would normally, and uh, it's going to make sure that that uh, compressor doesn't run as frequently. And again, the compressor doesn't run as frequently. We're not cutting into the overall hours of, on the motor, which means the compressor can last, long, which is what we want to see. Any questions there, Dave? All right. Like I said, we got a lot coming in, but I, I, I'm keeping up so far, so we're good. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, that's it for our maintenance devices for now. Excuse me, taking a little drink. Um, line starters. They're called uh, magnetic line starters, motor starters, um, magnetic starters, all sorts of things. Um, I think it's a terrible name because they more stop things than start them. First, you know, to explain what these line starters are, uh, you'll see them on uh, three phase units typically. Um, because they're they're necessary they're almost it's a basically it's a it's a fundamental requirement of a three phase motor to have a line starter on it and have um uh protection like that um so when you're wiring a three phase motor there are lines already there that that will help it to or have it run um that that, that will allow the motor to run, but but it's necessary to put in the line starter in order to do that. Um, but the best way to think of what a line starter is, is to, um, you think about the surge protector on your computer. You know, if your house gets hit by lightning and you have surge protectors on your electronics, it's going to sense very quickly that there is an abnormal voltage coming in or abnormal amount of electricity coming in, and it will shut down the voltage from going past it into whatever it is plugged into it, your computer, your TV, what have you. Um, that is what a line starter is essentially for an air compressor. Um, you know, when when the uh, voltage, when harmful currents uh, hit the motor, you're gonna have a temperature rise, you're gonna have the motor overloaded. Um, alternatively, you can have sustained low voltage that causes uh, overheating of the motor because the motor then is is uh, trying to run, but it can't, and that causes overheating as well. Uh, and this can be caused by lock rotors as well. Um, we uh, we strongly recommend that, that you use a line starter with any compressor um, just to protect the compressor and protect the investment that you made in the compressor. Um, we know that's not always practical, but it you know, it's, doesn't mean it's not a good idea. Um, Here's how one of the setups work. You can see that we have lines going. You have our industrial duty disconnect, which again, just quick sidebar is a requirement in the standard now, um, as opposed to using a light switch, uh, which are not allowed. Light switches are not allowed. You should really be using an industrial duty disconnect uh, to hook up your air compressors. And uh, right beneath that is where you see your line starter. The way the line starter works is when it it senses those um, you know, high voltage, bad voltage, something going on that can damage the unit uh, past it. Uh, it quick, quickly cuts off power between it and that unit. And that blue button that you see on it is the button, is the reset button. So basically what happens is, is that power will remain off on that air compressor until the line starter uh, button is pressed. When the line starter button gets pressed, then the if the uh, problem, let's say it was a lightning strike or whatever, you press that button and the compressor should come back on, as long as the box wasn't fried or whatever. But you know, uh, a, a lot of times this happens with um, you know when electricians are rewiring a building or rewiring a section of a building, and there's potentially that you know the compressor gets put on a uh, a circuit with other with other equipment, things like that, because it should be on a dedicated circuit. Um, so it can happen like that, you know, where where things are just being changed from the original design, and then all of a sudden it gets bad 
uh, voltage and it needs to, whether it's low voltage or high voltage, uh, depending on what it's uh, been pre-wired for, you need to uh, go out there and reset it and then it'll come back on. Um, so any three phase unit that you put in is going to require one of these. Um, and we also any compressor with a motor larger than one horsepower. So for us, that'd be one and a half and up. Uh, we do a one and a half horsepower unit up to five. I think we do a couple units that are seven horsepower. Anything single phase that's above one horsepower is going to need a line starter. And anything three phase, uh, any size is going to need a line starter. Um, a bit about these two, sometimes they can be a pain in the neck uh, when it comes from an ordering standpoint. We do not include them with our compressors because we think it's more important to send compressors in the field that have um, different voltages um, available so that when they get to the job site, if it's 115, 208, or 230, you can wire for any of those. The problem is, is that a line starter is voltage specific. So until we know exactly what voltage and what unit, what voltage you're wiring for and what unit you're using with, then we can put in the correct components to make the line starter work. So oftentimes in the field, these things become a problem. I can tell you that it's about a one day turnaround on them. And um, again, if you know you want or need one, you simply, when you put in your order for the compressor, you need to include the information about the voltage that the unit is being wired for. Um, they are voltage specific. Pressure switches. Um, everybody uh, has to come across a pressure switch uh, when they're using an, an air compressor. Um, oftentimes, if you try adjusting one, you can run into some problems there, especially if you don't know which screw to turn. I'm going to try to play a video on here, see how it goes when we get to it. Um, hopefully that will help clear some of this up. If not, I will try to explain some of it or I'll refer you to the video on our website. But that said, um, the first thing I'd like to reassure everybody, because, you know, again, the, the, the pressure switch is the brains of the air compressor. It tells the compressor when to turn on and turn off what to do. Right. And um, sometimes you need to make some adjustments to it. Like I said, that can often cause problems if it's not quite done right. Um, so what I'd like to assure everybody is that first, you know, we wouldn't have a UL listing on our compressors uh, if we didn't pass a, if our pressure switches didn't pass a 100,000 cycle UL compliance test. Um, so that's UL taking random pressure switches from us uh, from time to time and running them to make sure that they go to 100,000 cycles. We often tell them to, um, run them, you know, once they, once they run them to 100,000 cycles, we tell them run it to death. And uh, at that point, uh, the pressure switches that we use typically um, kind of fail around 200 to 250,000 cycles. Uh, again, trying to, you know, understand the difference between what, what goes into a fire protection air compressor and what, um, you know, a retail air compressor. A retail air compressor pressure switch, it's going to last about 30,000 cycles. Um, as opposed to 100 to 200,000 cycles like uh, like the professional duty uh, ones that we use. Something else to watch out for is that uh, there's a lot of digital pressure switches on the market, which offer a lot of convenience. And notably, we have not put out one uh, just yet. Uh, we, are, we are going to, uh, but we decided that there wasn't any out there that were good enough um, that we wanted to use. So we've, we've been developing our own pressure switch, which is going to come out, I'm hoping, in the third, fourth quarter this year, and uh, our own digital pressure switch. And it's uh, I mean, we already actually have them out on our H2 home units, uh, 13D residential pump and tanks. Um, but you'll start to see them on compressors. Uh, like I said, sometime towards the end of this year, we'll be talking more about that. But I wanted to let you know that they're coming and why we didn't why we didn't just jump on the bandwagon. Uh, again, I understand the convenience of it, but to us, it's much more important that these things work uh, properly and for a long time. And I don't want to see a compressor fail at 30,000 cycles, um, which which most of the digital pressure switches that I know of on the market will fail at because we investigated using those uh, anywhere between 30 and 40,000 cycles is their max. Um, that's why they, they're not UL listed as well. 
Uh, so something to keep an eye out for. But when you get ours, it will be a UL listed uh, pressure, digital pressure switch, and it will be um, uh, up to these types of compliance tests, 100,000 cycles and such. But for now, we use mechanical switches and we use a variety of them uh, across our product line. And this is uh, some of that breakdown. This sheet is available on our website if you ever need to get into, um, you know, know which pressure switch goes with, with, the, with which unit. But another thing to do is to just give us a call. Call the 800 number, 800-345-8207. Uh, you say, I have this pressure, I have this compressor and I need a replacement switch. It's no sweat. Um, and uh, we can identify exactly what the right pressure switch is for you and send that out to you. Uh, with the factory settings. Additionally, if you ever place an order for compressors and um, you need a specific setting, like you see on that first line, ROL plus up to one half uses the SWP 60401U with a factory setting of 2740. Um, and there's a 13 PSI differential in there. With that, let's say you needed it set somewhere a little bit lower, a little bit higher, we'd be happy to preset that for you here so that when you get it at your job site, it's already set for you. Um, that's just a question of coordinating that through the order and that order can go on the, uh, or that information can go on the order from our distributors to us. Um, you just need to make sure that that does go through or another way to do it is to call us and, and add it to the order. Um, this is another similar breakdown of those same switches uh, and what switch goes with what type of unit. Fire protection air compressors are normally set at 30 to 30 PSI cut in and 40 PSI cut out. So cut in means when the uh, pressure switch will send the signal to the motor to turn on and cut out is uh, when the pressure switch will send the signal to the motor to turn off. Um, while adjustments can be made, uh, make sure one, that the compressor is isolated from the system while you make those uh, adjustments as best you can. So we always recommend that there's an isolation valve uh, in line in the system. Um, but the pressure switch uh, adjustment, again, make sure you're adjusting the um, the differential or not not adjusting the differential screw. You want to make sure that the differential doesn't go any lower than what it's preset for. In this instance, the differential is 10 psi between the 30 and 40 psi cutout. That's the lowest. Like we always preset these at the lowest differential that they could possibly be at. You can increase the differential in some instances that's necessary. Please call us first. You know we always put this sticker on these pressure switches that says May Void Warranty. And that's because we want to scare you into calling us. It's not because we're looking to void warranties or anything like that. What we want is when you pop the cap off of that pressure switch and you're not sure which is the differential screw and which is the uh, range screw, the range screw is the one that you should be adjusting uh, if, if you decide to adjust the pressure switch. We, if you're not sure which one in, you don't start just turning screws. Uh, because if you start to turn the differential screw and you're not paying attention exactly to how you did it, you're not going to be able to undo it. Uh, we can't even undo it here. At the best, at this point, the the best thing to do is to um, uh, replace the switch. Right. So that's that's what I, I got ahead of myself here. But it's best practice to only make adjustments on the main calibration screw or the range adjustment screw, not the uh, the differential screw. And again, like what we've we've even gone to steps of putting glue over the screw, uh, the differential screw, or both screws just so that people don't start messing with them easily. Uh, again, we're not trying to, uh, they are adjustable pressure switches. We're not trying to void warranties or anything. We're just trying to uh, make sure that that you don't accidentally uh, adjust this thing out of range, especially when, like I said, it's, it's a phone call to us uh, that takes two minutes that we can tell you which screw is which and which one to turn. And then the other thing is when you're turning them, quarter turn and check the pressure. That's the mantra that we have around here. Quarter turn and check the pressure. So turn it a little bit. Make sure you're uh, you realize that you're turning either clockwise or counterclockwise. But then check your pressure. Let it run. If you're not quite where you need to be, turn in another quarter turn. Get a feel for how that that uh, switch is changing the the uh, pressure range. Uh, before you just go turn in the thing three or four times, you weren't sure which direction and you don't know what you did. Like just take your time with it. Quarter turn, check the pressure. 
Uh, let me try seeing if this video works. Okay, cool. So it's going to work. So just real quick to introduce this, this is a pressure switch video about the how the pressure switches function, cut in and cut out. So it, it'll do it, yeah, hopefully uh, with some visuals here, it'll do a better job of explaining uh, what how, how the pressure switch works and the differential screw and the range screw and whatnot. Hi, I'm Ray Fremont Jr., Marketing Manager for General Air Products, and I'm going to tell you how to adjust the pressure on the SWP-60601U pressure switch. The SWP-60601U pressure switch is used on all of our OL Plus riser and tank mounted units from 3 quarter horsepower up to 2 horsepower. These pressure switches come preset at 30 pounds on, 44 pounds off. They can be adjusted as low as 25 pounds on, 39 pounds off and as high as 41 pounds on, 55 pounds off. The 14 pound differential must always be maintained. The key to adjusting the pressure switch correctly is knowing which parts you'll be working with. Begin by removing the cover. Note that there are pressure switch adjustment procedures inside the cover of every one of our pressure switches. The first part of the pressure switch I want you to take note of is the electrical connection terminals for incoming power and power to the motor. This is the pressure adjustment screw, which we'll be turning to adjust the pressure range as we move forward. And this is the differential pressure screw. Do not touch the differential pressure screw. Allow me to explain. When we talk about adjusting the pressure on a pressure switch, we're adjusting the cut in and cut out pressures simultaneously while leaving the differential pressure unaffected. When the cut in pressure is reached, the switch sends a signal to the motor to run. When the cut out pressure is reached, the switch sends a signal to the motor to turn off. When the differential pressure is adjusted incorrectly, these signals are sent too frequently, causing the pressure switch to fail or the compressor to short cycle itself to death. If you still think you need to adjust the differential pressure, please call us at 800-345-8207 to speak with a tech for further instruction. To adjust the cut-in and cut-out pressure simultaneously, you need to turn the pressure adjustment screw on the pressure switch. Now remember, adjusting the pressure switch is not an exact science. Some manufacturing tolerance should be allowed for. Start by turning the pressure adjustment screw one full turn only. Clockwise to increase pressure. Counterclockwise to decrease pressure. Once you've made one full turn, let the compressor run. Check the closest pressure gauge to see where the pressure lands. Simply repeat this process until you reach the desired pressure setting. One last thing to remember. Whenever you buy a General Air Products fire protection air compressor, you have access to technical support for the entire life of the unit. So whether you have additional questions about how to adjust the pressure switch or anything that arises around the function of the air compressor, please feel free to give us a call at 800-345-8207. We'll be happy to help you. Thanks. That's depressing to me because I was so young then, and that was a... Uh easily 10 years ago uh so <laughs> but the information's still good um i haven't watched that video in a while um okay so hopefully that gave you a better uh understanding of uh how the pressure switches function and and some of their different parts um so but again you know the the main takeaway with the pressure switches is to spread the word especially to your field techs that if you have an issue with a pressure switch, if they have to make any adjustments to a pressure switch, just call General first. Just have us on the line while you do it. If you haven't done it before, another thing too is that you know we we you know we practice you know we we have a, a, a like a practice area in our um, training facility here on how to do those pressure switch adjustments. So you know again, if you're ever able to send some people our way, we'll be more than happy to train them up on how to do that. Um, so moving on from pressure switches, some of the other um, parts that I like to talk about are one of the, the accessories I like to talk about. The um, stainless steel flex hose with a uh, half inch union, we include those with every compressor now. So again, when you're thinking about, you know, maybe even price differences between us and some of our competition and stuff like that, understand that 
that you know like our riser mount compressors come with a flex hose and a riser mounting bracket with no extra charge that's in the box uh our tank mounted units come with the flex hose and vibration pads no extra charge that's in the box additionally we include with our lubricated units uh the specially formulated compressor oil that's in the box so you know we try to make sure that everything is set and ready to go uh and you have all the components that you could want or need uh to install these these compressors um so it's just something to keep in mind that those are all in the box um another thing i like to bring up with the the oil uh one if you have an oil lubricated compressor uh you may see when you get it to a job site that in the um, site glass that there's a little oil in there. There is not enough oil to run it on. We're not allowed to ship lubricated units with oil in them. Okay, uh, we're, we're just not allowed. It's 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 not you're not allowed to ship like that. So the reason there's oil in there is because we run test our units. We run test everything that leaves our building and see it working before it goes into a box. Um, so that said there's just enough oil in there to for us to safely run the unit you still need to add the oil that comes with the unit additionally um you know we have the specially formulated compressor oil it, it's either uh 30 weight or 40 weight non-detergent um you just have to call us uh it depends on which units uh to get the uh to get the right oil um so if if you need oil replacement again you can oil order the oil from us, um, or you can go to your local auto zone or whatever and pick it up. But just make sure that, you know, you give us a ring and, and find out what, to make sure what the right one is. So this is the flex hose. Again, we have those in a variety of sizes. We include, like I said, it's a 30 inch stainless steel flex hose uh, with our, our compressors but uh, we offer down to 12 inch and up to four feet. So if, if you need them, we can supply those as well. Uh, and again, the vibration isolation pads. We have a riser tank kit. Um, these are basically tank mounted uh, three gallon, um, uh, or I'm sorry, they're, they're riser mounting three gallon tanks. Um, we, we started using these when uh, people started putting accelerators on, on uh, these uh, lines. When you have an accelerator with a riser mounting um, air compressor, uh, especially a low pressure riser mounting air compressor, you don't have a lot of play as far as pressure fluctuations, and you can get uh, the uh, you can trip the system. We, we've seen a lot of problems with that. Now, whenever I talk to accelerator people, they say that doesn't make sense, and I say, okay, but you're not answering our phone. Uh, our our phone calls say that these are problems. Uh, so what we did was we came up with this riser mounting. Um, tank uh, that works as a buffer there um, so we're pulling off of some of that reserve which uh, so instead of having to buy a tank mounted unit you can do that you know, riser mounted unit with the uh, three gallon tank but again if you're using an accelerator uh, I highly recommend using a tank mounted unit um, also if you have an older system that where the compress the riser mounting compressor is running a lot of tank mounting uh, a riser tank kit isn't a bad idea there either either uh, the automatic tank drains um that assembly that black assembly there on the right uh, is a little float that um little float drain that is has an assembly that allows it to be fit underneath of the tank um i i think you know i think they're great um most people don't buy them until they've broken a couple air compressors with too much water collecting in the tank first um in florida they ask us why this isn't included in every single compressor because of the amount of humidity in the air um and how much water gets collected in the tanks so it really is up to you how to use them but you know I, I like to let people know that you know again when you compress air you get water that water collects in the tank if you don't go around draining the tank on a regular basis more often times in the summer than you do in the winter um, the uh you know because there's more humidity in the summer than the winter um you're going to have water start to fill up in that tank um and depending on how much humidity it can fill up rather quickly so one of the ways to alleviate that is to put one of these automatic tank drains on there uh ad 3400 is a manual desk and air dryer so you can see the how the assembly is hooked up there um you know so oftentimes and again if you can see my cursor people run uh kind of like a, um, a bypass valve on this or a bypass line on this to go around it 
So at certain times of the year, uh, let's say the summer and the spring, and maybe part of the fall, they just run the compressor regular, but like, you know, uh, they don't want to get any ice plugs in there um, for like, let's say a parking garage in Boston or Minneapolis or something like that. So then during the winter, when it gets below freezing, they switch it over to um, manual desk and dryer mode and it goes through there. And then what these desk and dryers have in them is is desiccant, which is like in our dry air packs and desiccant is also in those packets that say do not eat and your beef jerky and your shoes and stuff, don't eat them. Um, it will give you a tummy ache. The uh, manual desk and dryer though uh, has color changing desiccant, which is a little different in that it, it changes color when it uh, gets um, saturated with water. So then you know it's time to replace the desiccant. And then if you're using it with a lubricated unit, you need a coalescing filter. Coalescing filters remove oil vapor and other contaminants before they get to the uh, desiccant. Uh, again, I wanna just reiterate before we wrap up here that uh, customer care comes first. So this is our uh, customer uh, service team here. Uh, please call us when you need us. Call us from the field. Uh, if you put in an order uh, and you get a, a delivery time that you're not liking, call us and we'll see if we can help you out. We usually can, I mean, but I, I can't emphasize enough how accessible we are um, and I know that people more and more get out of touch with that because they think that they're not going to talk to a real human being or they're not going to get any help. Uh, that is not the case here. We are very old school in that regard. We have real life human beings who know what they're talking about answering the phones. Uh, they will be able to help you. Um, again, we have our sprinkler system training center. I want you to understand that we have not just uh, air compressors in there but we have a full line of, of all the manu major manufacturers, dry valves, pre-action valves. We have a deluge valve now. We have uh, Viking was kind enough to give us a, a pre-action cabinets for single and double interlock. We have residential, we have uh, our, our residential pumps in there. We have uh, several different wet valves. We have backflow. We have uh, a, a fire pump. You saw some of the pictures of the fire pump in, here's one here. But you know we have nitrogen generator stuff. All of AGF's products are here. So they're testing drains and all the other things that they make because they're right down the road from us. So what we tried to make this place is, a, is a, a place where all the manufacturers can put all of their equipment. And you know, so if you want to come in here and, and do training on a variety of equipment, you have a variety of equipment here to do that. It's not just one manufacturer, it's all manufacturers. So we've been trying to be very, uh, very open like that and it's working out really well. I'm very look, very much looking forward to stuff coming back. Again, go to training.generalairproducts.com and you will find um, uh, information about when we uh, start those classes again. This is my email again, rmfjr at General Air Products. Please do use it, the 800 number. Again, please do use that as well.